So without further ado, I'd ask our presenters to uh, walk us through today's topic, uh, which looks at the findings that the U.S. Department of Education's Clery Act Compliance Team has done um, on Pennsylvania State University's efforts to comply with Clery Act and the Drug Free Schools and Communities Act. Um, there's been a final program review determination that it's very interesting to look at. So, without further ado, Karen, do you want to start us off today? Yes, thank you, Michele, and thank you everyone for joining us. Today's webinar was prompted by the Department of Education's compliance review at Penn State because it's a comprehensive case study with valuable lessons for conducting an internal review of Clery policies and procedures. This is important not just for legal compliance, but also to create an effective campus safety and crime prevention program. Before we get started, I think it's important to remind ourselves why we have the Cleary Act. As most of us know, Jean Cleary was raped and murdered in her dorm room in 1986. Her parents fought hard to get legislation passed requiring schools to disclose crime and security information because they saw how important it is for students and employees to have information about crime and safety on their campuses so they can protect themselves and hopefully prevent similar tragedies. The Cleary started with state legislation and eventually the federal law was passed in 1990, which was later renamed in Jean Cleary's memory. The Cleary Act's been amended several times over the years, and most recently in 2013, the VAWA amendments added dating violence, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking to the required crime statistics. And it also added uh, requirements for sexual and interpersonal violence prevention education. The new edition of the Cleary Handbook that was issued in June of this year covers the Cleary Act requirements for these prevention pro programs. And Rob and I put together a white paper that explains the new guidance and best prevention practices. At the end of this slide presentation is a bibliography with links to the white paper and other resources referenced in today's webinar. So a little bit of background. Um, the Penn State case is most co the most comprehensive Clery Act compliance review conducted by the Department of Education. And while its five-year investigation was prompted by allegations that the university failed to act on reports of child abuse by Jerry Sandusky, some of which occurred on Penn State's campus, it uncovered systemic Clery Act violations. In its final report, the department describes the Cleary Act as a campus security and crime prevention law with a consumer information and protection focus. It has two main functions, um, to increase campus safety and security and enhance transparency of information. And to achieve these goals, the Cleary Act requires schools to inform students and employees of campus security procedures and practices and report accurate crime statistics and timely security information. So today's agenda, um, we've broken down the department's 239-page report into five important lessons that provide a framework for collecting and delivering campus safety information. First, schools need to make sure that students and employees know their reporting options and what happens after a report is made. Also, identify and train campus security authorities about their reporting obligation. Provide sufficient oversight and coordination to ensure that campus safety policies and procedures are being followed, and to ensure that vital and timely security information is delivered to the campus community. Finally, the 
schools need to make sure to develop and implement a drug and alcohol abuse prevention program as required by the Drug-Free Schools and Communities Act. And as pointed out by the department, the intent behind these requirements is to empower students and employees to play an informed and active role in their own safety as well as the safety of others. Providing information to students and employees about reporting options and what to expect after a report is made addresses these two central precepts of the Clery Act. We know that students and employees will often report to a trusted source, not local police. So to encourage reporting, they need to know where and how to report and then what happens after a report is filed. And here's what the department said about providing information about reporting options. While it is not necessary, advisable, or in many cases even possible to list every campus security authority, the intent of the regulation is to provide a list of CSAs that the institution has designated as the preferred receivers of reports from students and employees beyond campus police or local law enforcement. This means that the annual security report needs to provide individual titles or names of departments and organizations and their contact information, but you don't need to name each and every campus security authority, especially for large campuses like Penn State. And I'll explain more about who are campus security authorities in the next section. The types of information that need to be provided about procedures after a report is made include contact information for on and off campus resources such as medical services, counseling, and victim advocates. Also available interim protective measures such as changing living situations or work or academic schedules and obtaining no contact orders. Also, you need to describe uh, student and employee investigations and disciplinary proceedings. And the department noted that this information needs to be in the policies th themselves, not just providing links to um, outside materials. The department required Penn State to develop policies and procedures to make sure that this information was kept current and easily found. And at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Rob, who will talk about identifying and overcoming, overcoming barriers to reporting. Thanks so much, Karen, and, and I appreciate the background on the compliance perspective to each of the pieces of the final report. Um, and from my perspective, I want to anchor compliance and the letter of the law within a broader spirit of the legislation and why the law was written in the way that it does. And you know, we all know that far too few students who experience sexual assault come forward and report their experience to school administrators or to the police. According to EverFi research from our nationally administered campus climate survey, only 8% of sexual assault survivors reported the incident to school officials at their institution. Uh, interestingly enough, about 25% of sexual assault survivors told no one about their experiences. And the main reasons that were cited by survivors for not reporting was one, that it's a private matter that they wanted to deal with on their own, two, that they were ashamed or embarrassed about what happened, and three, that they didn't think what happened was serious enough. 
And so I think it's very important for us to understand the context and the barriers that are keeping students from coming forward. And these reasons for not reporting represent opportunities and focus areas for all of us as administrators to help overcome some of those challenges. So certainly making students aware that it's not something that they have to deal with alone, that there are resources available, that it's absolutely something that is not their fault that they shouldn't be embarrassed or ashamed about, and certainly that what happened to them was serious and that something can be done about it. And once we help to overcome those barriers, the hope is that we'll see more students feeling safe and supported to come forward and share their experience. So when we look at the right side of the screen, one of the implications that we've learned from our research is that including information about reporting in our prevention and education trainings can lead to increased rate of reporting amongst survivors. For example, survivors who indicated that they had received training on procedures followed to investigate a complaint of sexual assault were 60% more likely than survivors who had not received that training to come forward and report. Similarly, survivors who received training on how to report a complaint of sexual assault were 50% more likely to report, and survivors who received training on the availability of confidential resources to support them were 19% more likely than other survivors to come forward and report as well. So I think it's very important that we make this information very readily accessible for students, and that includes making it accessible online. And the Department uh, of Education was very clear about this in their April 2015 Dear Colleague letter on Title IX coordinators, where OCR encouraged schools to create a page on their website that includes the name and contact information of the Title IX coordinator, relevant Title IX policies and grievance procedures, and other resources related to Title IX compliance and gender equity, and that a link to this page should be prominently displayed on the campus's home page. Um, so I think it's very important and a very clear line in showing that we have to be making this information as accessible as possible to students to help overcome the barriers to them coming forward and reporting. Thank you, Rob. Um, and as Rob just pointed out, providing information and identifying and overcoming barriers are essential steps in encouraging reporting. And identifying and training campus security authorities is a critical step in establishing a systematic process for collecting accurate crime data. So the first question is, who are campus security authorities? Uh, the Cleary Handbook defines campus security authorities as individuals with functions involving relationships with students. For a small school, there may be just a few campus security authorities, or maybe it's only the Title IX coordinator, but that's not workable or acceptable for large schools like Penn State, because most large campuses have campus police and a campus security department other individuals who are also responsible for campus security, such as residence hall monitors, parking guards, event security personnel, and student escorts. In addition, there are other officials who have significant responsibility for student and campus activities, such as athletic coaches, faculty advisors, Title IX coordinators, and directors of campus health and counseling centers. And the Clery Handbook recommends that the list of campus security authorities be updated at least annually and that schools also document their rationale for designating individuals as CSA. So the Penn State case provides some instructive examples of um, unidentified areas where there you will find campus security authorities. Um, prior to being investigated, Penn State had identified about 200 campus security authorities, but at the time that the final report was issued, they'd identified over 4,000, which gives you an idea of the scope of this task on a, a large campus. So the department highlighted these four areas of unidentified campus security authorities at Penn State. 
the Office of Human Resources received reports of workplace sexual misconduct, but there were no reports collected from that office. Also at the Office of Fraternity and Sorority Life, um, it was a self-governing body with student administrators who uh, received reports of uh, campus crime, but uh, again, no reports were collected from that office. And the entire Center for Women Students uh, was designated as professional counseling, even though there were staff members who did not have uh, professional licenses that would have um, included them in the exemption for professional and pastoral counselors um, who are exempted from uh, the reporting requirements of a campus security authority. And then also staff handling trauma drops uh, received reports of traumatic events when a student came forward and asked to withdraw or drop a class and those reports were also overlooked. But it's not enough to just identify campus security authorities. Uh, they also need to understand their duty to report. The department acknowledged that the Clery Act doesn't mandate training and that it allows <coughs> flexibility regarding how schools achieve compliance. But there still needs to be a functioning compliance system in place, which led the department to conclude that it is virtually impossible to achieve compliance without training campus security authorities that they are required to report crime data. The Clery Handbook also recommends that campus security authorities be trained on the importance of their role in Clery compliance and on completing reporting forms and other documentation to verify the accuracy of the crime statistics, and also the importance of timely submission and where to send their report. The department required Penn State to establish policies and procedures for reporting and compiling reports from campus security authorities and other officials and offices that may receive reports, and also to develop and deliver annual training to all campus security authorities. It is also important to note that uh, campus security, it is also important that campus security authorities are trained on how to respond to survivors of sexual and interpersonal violence. And I'm going to hand it back to Rob to talk about the experience of survivors when they report. Thank you, Karen. And I think that it's really important that when we're thinking about the training of our campus security authorities as well as our responsible employees on campus, that we're thinking beyond just their reporting obligations. And you know, you know, we think about the experience that survivors have when they make that difficult choice to come forward and report. We have to have administrators that aren't just aware of their own reporting obligations, but are able to respond to the needs of that person who disclosed to them sensitively and effectively. And there's a whole line of research on a domain called institutional betrayal that demonstrate the profound role of institutional response to a report of sexual assault in either mitigating or exacerbating the trauma that's experienced by the student who came forward and made that disclosure. So there's huge implications to the role that we can play, and there's a lot hanging in the balance. EverFi research has absolutely identified this as an area for improvement across institutions of higher ed. So once again, going back to our climate survey data, which was participated in by 150 institutions across the country and tens of thousands of students completed this survey. Among students who indicated that they experienced sexual assault and reported the incident to their school, only 24% of them felt that they were treated fairly through their school's procedures. That's really, really important, uh, particularly when we think about the process of coming forward and how challenging it can be and the process of coming to a resolution. And when we asked students how they felt their school's formal procedures helped them to deal with the incident, nearly half 
of sexual assault victims who reported felt that their school's procedures helped them either very little or not at all. And only about less than 30% indicated that they felt their school's formal procedures helped them a lot or completely solved the problem for them. So beyond just thinking about CSA training and the responsibilities we have to report, this really does signify a need for ongoing population level staff and faculty training. At the very least, to avoid the legal liabilities that might exist when we ineffectively or insensitively respond to survivors, but also the, the moral responsibilities that we should feel in creating an environment that they feel safe and supported to disclose something like this that happened to them. Thank you, Rob. At this point, the first two lessons have given us a framework for providing information to students and employees about their reporting options and what happens after a report, as well as identifying and training campus security authorities. But for compliance and an effective, and effective campus safety program, there also needs to be participation and cooperation by CSAs and officials and a coordinated effort to collect data from all the different sources on campus. And the key finding of Penn State's Special Investigative Council underscores this point. The university had no centralized office, officer, or committee to oversee institutional compliance with laws, regulations, policies, and procedures and certain departments monitored their own compliance issues with very limited resources. And I also want to cover some basics about required crime statistics because 90% of the historic $2.4 million fine the department the department has recommended for Penn State's Cleary Act violations was for failing to properly classify reported incidents and disclose accurate crime statistics. At a very basic level, the Cleary Act requires schools to collect reports that are made to or brought to the attention of campus security authorities that involve Cleary reportable crimes and also schools need to request crime statistics from local police. Um, I also want to mention that the handbook says that bringing um, information to the attention of campus security authorities does not include information um, obtained indirectly, such as overhearing a conversation or a survivor sharing their experience in a speech or workshop or presentation. It needs to be a, a direct uh, report or um, otherwise bringing information to the CSA's attention. In addition to the lack of oversight and coordination to collect the necessary data, there were other problems at Penn State that created Clery Act violations. Um, one of those areas was under-reports and examples of the under-reports at Penn State were that, as we talked about earlier, staff didn't know they were campus security authorities, so their, the reports that they received were not collected. Also, crimes were misclassified, such as downgrading aggravated assault to simple assault and forcible sex offenses to harassment. Another example occurred when two cases of sexual assault were reported by campus police in a single incident report, so it was counted as one crime instead of two. Um, another area of, uh, under, of reports that were um, not collected were crime statistics that were, un that were um, improperly labeled as unfounded reports. Um, this, need, this determination needs to be made by law enforcement that the report was false or baseless and uh, not a determination by a campus official. 
Also, uh, Penn State reported statistics for the academic year, not for a calendar year as required by the Clery Act. And there were also discrepancies between the crime statistics published in their annual security report and those that were uploaded to the department's database. So the required action um, items for Penn State to create a coordinated process for collecting data was to establish policies and procedures that address access, communication, and coordination of campus crime statistics and information across the campus and to develop a formal system for requesting, receiving, and compiling crime reports from CSAs so that accurate crime debate data is reported in both the annual security report and on the department's database. Creating this system for the flow of information from campus security authorities up to the annual security report and the database achieves, achieves the Clery Act's goals to both identify crime trends and security risks and also inform students and employees of campus security procedures and practices. I'm going to hand it back to Rob now to talk about another reason why the accuracy of crime data is important. Thank you, Karen. And I want to recognize that we are all at the half hour mark and we will go, be going a little bit beyond our time today. And just to remind folks that a recording and copy of the slides will be made available to you. Now, thinking about um, the, the reason annual security reports are important and the accurate disclosure of information really goes back to the fundamentals of the Cleary Act uh, in that when Jean Cleary's parents were investigating her rape and murder at Lehigh University, they uncovered a number of other crimes that had happened at this otherwise perceived safe haven where they were sending their daughter that were not transparent to people who were considering that institution. And so it's very important that this information is accurately recorded and made um, available to folks. And what's very interesting is the American Association of University Women did research um, of the examining the 2014 annual security reports for campuses across the country. And what they found was that over 90% of campuses reported zero incidents of rape in the 2014 calendar year. Now, this is significantly at odds with decades of research on the prevalence of sexual assault. And so there's two possible implications that we have to be considering. One is that crime disclosures are not being accurately recorded and funneled up into the annual security report. Or two, and more problematically, is that we've not created an environment that victims feel safe and support, supported coming forward and sharing their experiences. And if we're not having students reporting their experiences, we're very limited in our ability to hold those offenders accountable um, for committing these crimes. And so I think both of those implications are very important ones in shaping the priorities of our work. Thank you, Rob. Um, now we're, I'm going to switch gears from reporting crime data to other types of security information required by the Clery Act to prevent crime. Uh, these are timely warnings, emergency notifications, missing person notifications, and the daily crime laws. The purpose of a timely warning is to enable people to protect themselves. So a warning must be issued when crimes reported to either campus security authorities or local police uh, represent a serious or continuing threat to the health or safety of the campus community. The final report states the, these warnings are one of the most important provisions of the Clery Act and fundamental to campus safety goals. 
and you can <laughs> find uh, specific provisions for uh, require requirements for timely warnings in the Clery Handbook, but briefly, your policies need to describe the circumstances for which a timely warning will be issued, who is responsible for issuing the warning, and how the warning will be delivered. Now, you don't need to have all the facts uh, before issuing a timely warning. You just need to have enough information to determine there's a threat. There's also no required method for distributing the warning or the type of information that needs to be included. What's required is to provide enough information to promote safety. And this may include personally identifiable information under the FERPA exception for a disclosure of personally identifiable information in health and safety emergency situations. Emergency notifications um, apply to situations that present a significant emergency or dangerous situation to the health or safety of the campus community. The Clery Handbook says that schools must have an emergency plan, test it, evaluate it, and publicize it. And Missing person notifications, um, these only apply to students living on campus, which includes foreign campuses as well as domestic campuses. Um, and again, I'll refer you to the handbook for the specifics, but um, briefly, the policies uh, must include contact information for individuals or organizations where uh, a missing student should be reported. Um, require missing student reports to be referred immediately to either campus police or security or to local law enforcement. Also, you need to give students the option to provide contact information for persons that campus officials and law enforcement can contact if that student is reported missing. And also advise students that law enforcement will be notified within 24 hours or as soon as the school determines that the stu a student is missing. The daily crime log, uh, it only applies to schools that have campus police or a campus security department. Um, it includes all crimes, not just Cleary crimes, that are reported to campus police or campus security. And these reports must be recorded in the daily crime log within two days of the report and be accessible during normal business hours. The required action um, under the department's final report was to have policies and procedures for issuing these warnings and notifications and to make sure that the daily crime log is kept updated and is available to the campus community and to the general public. And now Rob is going to talk about the advantages of increased transparency. Thanks, Karen. There are lots of ways that we can increase transparency. There are crime logs, timely warnings, annual security reports, and climate surveys, all mechanisms for making our communities aware of the extent of these challenges that we're facing. And it's really critical to be transparent with what's going on in our communities in terms of reported sexual assault, but also finding a mechanism to capture the incidence rate of sexual assault among students that aren't coming forward and reporting so that we can get a much more accurate and realistic perspective of the extent of these challenges at our institutions. And all of that's really critical for overcoming misperceptions that minimize the extent of sexual violence at each of our individual campuses. And this was particularly clear in a Gallup and Inside Higher Ed survey in 2015 of college presidents where 32% of college presidents agreed that sexual assault is prevalent on U.S. campuses, but only 6% agreed that sexual assault is prevalent on their campus. And 77% of those college presidents 
felt that their school was doing a good job already protecting women from sexual assault. So if that's the perspective of the most senior leaders at our institution who often uh, hold the keys to funding and staffing decisions, it's really critical for us to be collecting and sharing data that help to overcome these misperceptions if we want to ultimately be increasing the investment we have, certainly in terms of uh, our response mechanisms, but more importantly, in upstream prevention initiatives to keep these things from happening. The other obvious advantage to increase transparency through things like the timely warning is to improve risk awareness in our community as necessary and ultimately to increase accountability. When people see that crimes are being reported and people are being held responsible for their behaviors, it gives a sense that these are crimes and offenses that institutions take very seriously. And the last advantage to increase transparency is helping to level the playing field nationally. Because as we look at the number of colleges and universities under investigation for Title IX violations with OCRs, about 200, 250 schools, it's very easy for an uninformed populace to look at that list and say that this is just a problem of 200 bad apples but ultimately it's really just localized to those schools when in fact we know that sexual violence isn't a unique problem at a handful of institutions. It's a problem that all of us are sharing and when it becomes clear that this is a problem across the board through things like climate surveys, then we can all start from the same place and we don't need to try to push these things aside to save the reputation of our institutions. It's commonly accepted that it's happening here. So therefore, we can distinguish ourselves as leaders by taking a more proactive stance in the way that we're responding to incidences and in the way that we're putting resources towards prevention. Thank you, Rob. So our last lesson is on developing and implementing a drug and alcohol prevention program. The department emphasized the importance of having intentional and sustained efforts to limit illegal use and abuse of drugs and alcohol on campus. And the report cites the Cleary Division's own research that found that more than 90% of all serious campus crimes involve the use and abuse of alcohol and drugs. So the Drug-Free Schools and Communities Act requires schools to provide drug and alcohol prevention programs to all students and employees, which re requires more than just putting the information in the school's annual security report. And it applies to students enrolled in a summer term as well as adjunct and visiting faculty members. This is not just an annual um, distribution of information. It's an ongoing um, requirement throughout the year to make sure that all employees and all en enrolled students are getting this information. And the required content for a drug and alcohol abuse prevention program is to cover the school standards of conduct, uh, legal sanctions under federal, state, and local laws, um, the health risks associated with the use of illicit drugs and alcohol abuse, and also to provide information about available resources for individuals with drug or alcohol abuse issues. The Act also requires that schools review their programs every two years for effectiveness and make changes as needed to improve its effectiveness and to make sure that disciplinary sanctions are being consistently applied. And the required action um, for Penn State was to develop these policies and procedures and implement a drug and alcohol abuse prevention program that complied with the Drug-Free Schools and Communities Act. And now I'm going to hand it back to Rob uh, to talk about the importance of drug and alcohol education. 
Thanks, Karen. And, and while this is absolutely, um, there are many precedent, uh, precedents set in this final report for Penn State, the inclusion of the Drug-Free Schools and Community Act, and particularly Edgar Part 86 with the biennial review requirement, has been part of a number of compliance reviews and friendly visits from the Department of Education historically. So this isn't necessarily a new thing for schools. And it's also not something that is just simply isolated to compliance with the Drug-Free Schools and Community Act. Absolutely, Title IX guidance recommends that student training includes the role that alcohol and drugs often play in sexual violence. We know, as Karen mentioned, alcohol is involved in many, if not most, incidents of sexual assault on campus. And this is absolutely not to say that alcohol causes sexual assault, but the culture around alcohol and sex is often at odds with healthy relationships and healthy sexuality. And it's also important in terms of Clery Act compliance around required information about risk reduction, that we're talking about options that are designed to decrease perpetration and bystander inaction, and ultimately to empower uh, victims to promote safe communities and overcome some of the conditions that facilitate violence. So while it is certainly challenging to have conversations about the connections between alcohol and sexual assault in a way that's effective and that avoids some of the, the pitfalls of real or perceived victim blaming, it's more dangerous for us to not have these conversations. And it's really our responsibility as administrators to learn about how to have these conversations effectively with students. Now, in terms of having that conversation effectively, there's a number of areas that we need to be thinking about when we're talking about the role of alcohol and sexual assault. There's a lot of dynamics at play um, about this relationship that can be discussed, and many of them go far beyond alcohol as a risk factor for victimization. Alcohol is also a risk factor for perpetration. Alcohol is a risk factor for bystanders being able to actually step in in situations where they see a problem happening. If they're intoxicated, their ability to intervene effectively is going to be certainly compromised in those situations. And alcohol is just generally a risk factor for lots of the things that students want to get out of their college experience. And so it's really important that we, we be contextualizing alcohol as a global risk factor, not just a risk for victimization. And to give you an example of how to reframe that conversation away from very victim-focused language is the way that we talk about alcohol in our Haven program. So you can see the screenshot on the left side of the screen. We were very intentional with the language around how alcohol impacts judgment, motor control, and communication by saying that alcohol can be used to create or to degree, decrease a person's ability to detect risk or risky people. And alcohol can be used to impair a person's ability to resist an assault. It's not saying that alcohol decreases your ability to detect risk or it impairs your ability to resist an assault. It's language that subtly reframes it around how alcohol is used as a tool very intentionally by perpetrators to take advantage of another person. So that subtle reframing will not be lost on your students, particularly survivors who are going to be very sensitive to victim blaming language. So it's also important that we think about um, you know, the, the role that alcohol plays in actually having students come forward and reporting. There's been uh, research actually showing that survivors who were under the influence when they experienced a sexual assault were far less likely to come forward and report their experience compared to survivors who had not consumed alcohol or drugs um, at the time of their incident. So certainly, you know, that's an important factor as well. Now, to bring the conversation to a close today, and, and we very much appreciate the time that you all spent to, with us, I want to talk about this whole conversation about compliance in terms of both the letter and the spirit of the law. So when we think about the, the final program determination, there was a really powerful quote um, in the review from the Department of Education saying that the goals of Cleary can only be advanced and the intent of the act, the spirit of the law, realized when institutions carefully implement it and people in powerful positions are proactive, vigilant, honest, and transparent. 
about campus safety issues. And as parents, uh, or as um, Karen pointed out at the beginning of this webinar, you know, Cleary was ultimately intended to empower students and employees to play an active role in their safety and the safety of other members of their community. And the ultimate outcome of Cleary is not compliance, it's campus safety. So it's the responsibility of our most senior leaders on campus to demonstrate leadership and to commit to best practice. So as we bring this webinar to a close, I, I, there was a really powerful quote um, in the, the review saying that the Cleary Act is not simply a collection of regulatory hurdles for schools to negotiate. This law was written because the Department of Education wanted to help schools create safer, healthier campus communities. So while compliance with Cleary and Title IX move us in a positive direction, simply checking boxes is not going to make the change we need. So Karen, if you could just click forward, the animation here is going to show that what we're required to do doesn't equal the best work possible. But when we commit to doing the best work possible, Compliance is going to be a natural step in the process of truly making breakthrough impact around these issues. And when we look at the very mission our institutions were founded upon and put forward to uphold, truly creating a safe, healthy community is absolutely imperative to that mission. So with that, um, you will see on the next two slides, we will have a biography or a bibliography available for you all of the resources that we cited during this conversation. You will receive a recording of the slides um, and a copy of the PowerPoint deck itself. And I want to conclude by thanking you all so much for attending and for the great work that you do and to turn it over to Michaela to bring us to a close.